Okay, so now let's get to the brain part. How do our brains categorize speech sounds? How do our brains find phonemes? I'm going to focus on electrophysiological evidence because it gives us the time resolution that we really need to ask this question. We're gonna be interested in very rapid processes that happen relatively quickly after the onset of the stimulus. And it's uh, quite important that we can have confidence that the fact that we're looking at is actually a pretty fast one as opposed to something that happens um, at a kind of more task related stage of the trial. So you hear something and then maybe your task is to press a button. If we're uh, measuring uh, or using, for example, fMRI for the measurement, the fact could be something really late. We can't really tell from uh, uh, the data themselves. So this is gonna be all electrophysiology. Okay, so what do we know about how our brains categorize speech sounds into phonemes? So here I'm going to share with you two findings that we have, um, you know, decent confidence in. So the first one is that our brains get the job done within about 180 milliseconds after the sound onset. So if you hear ah, oh, then 180. 80 milliseconds after the onset of that sound, your brain would have figured out that that's an awe sound. And the evidence for this conclusion comes from so-called mismatch studies uh, that we'll learn about here. The second finding um, is a much more recent one. The first one is something that um, is, you know, a relatively old literature at this point. Um, the second one comes from much newer work. And that conclusion is that your superior temporal cortex, so the sort of auditory areas, um, seem to represent the distinctive feature space that we learned about in the last video uh, before that 180 millisecond uh, time point that we already knew was sort of the, in some sense, the end point of the, of the process. So now we have some more fine grained evidence that the relevant information is represented in auditory areas before that time point. And here the evidence comes from uh, natural listening uh, during direct recordings from the cortex. Remember there's a, a version of EEG that is used uh, in the patient setting. So from pre-surgical patients, uh, we're able to record uh, activity directly from the cortex as kind of a, a byproduct of their uh, pre-surgical preparation. So uh, from this type of uh, data, we've gotten some uh, very good uh, uh, temporal and spatial resolution that shows us that the feature space um, uh, is in some sense represented uh, in the relevant place in the brain. Okay, so we'll start with the first body of work. So first I want you to have a, a bit of an understanding of the basic shape of the evoked uh, electrophysiological response after you hear a sound. And so it looks something like this um, as measured by MEG. So remember magnetoencephalography. Um, and so this response has several different components, uh, but the biggest component is this peak around 100 milliseconds that we call the M100. So it's a magnetic response, um, roughly 100 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. Uh, the characteristic field pattern of that response, so if we just take the distribution of the magnetic field here uh, at the peak of the M100, looks something like this. So it's a bilateral response. If you apply the right-hand rule here, um, you'll conclude that the, um, the currents are pointing downward um, uh, in both uh, temporal cortices. So that your uh, bilateral uh, response from the auditory cortices on both sides. So the red blob here is representing outgoing magnetic flux and the blue blob re-entering magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic flux that is going back into the head. 
Okay, so, so this is a, a response that has been heavily studied, is very, very reliably, can be elicited from almost any uh, participant. And for that reason, it's been um, something that, uh, you know, has been easy to study. Uh, so what do we know about the M100? We can, of course, ask this question. Now it's like, oh, well, here's a big, you know, big peak in the response. Maybe that's doing phonological categorization. Well, what we know about it is obviously the bilaterality. Um, we also know that this response is really a basic response to all sounds. So you get this kind of characteristic response. The M100 is part of that response kind of no matter what the sound, okay? So it's not anything like a speech specific sound or anything like that uh, is elicited for all sounds. There's lots of ways to manipulate it experimentally. And by manipulate, manipulated, I mean we can change the stimuli and observe changes in the M100, either in the amplitude, like how big it is, or exactly how quickly after the stimulus onset it peaks. So that's the latency of the response. So here's some examples of what the M100 response is sensitive to. So it's sensitive to the intensity of the sound. So if you have uh, 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 a really, really high intensity sound, uh, you get a faster and bigger M100. Um, it's also uh, sensitive to the frequency of the sound. So higher frequency sound elicits a shorter latency. Um, sort of the broadest um, generalization has some uh, uh, other nuances that I won't get into here. Um, the phonetic identity of the sound also can move this response around. So for example, you get a shorter latency for an ah uh sound than an oo uh sound. Um, we can explain that in terms of the physical properties of those sounds. Remember, when we're um, studying sound, we always want to worry about just like the sheer physical properties of the sound. So here, you know, may not be like an interesting linguistic explanation. Um, and so a sh really brief summary of this literature is that for a long time, uh, the role of the M100, the auditory M100 in phoneme perception was rather unclear. So we knew a lot about it, but like whether it really is doing something special during speech perception and particularly phonological categorization just wasn't clear. Uh, so obviously, a, a, you know, a, a basic uh, uh, response, brain response to sounds, but um, exactly, you know, whether doing anything special in language, uh, not, not so clear. Okay. So then the second electrophysiological response component that I want you to know about, and this will be our focus here, is the auditory mismatch field. So now the auditory mismatch field is not a basic response to all sounds, okay? Instead, it's something like a change detector. So, um, so it's not the case that, you know, any sound that you hear, you're always going to get this response. I mean, already the naming of it implies that. Um, rather, it's something that um, shows up when your sort of expectation is violated. Uh, and I just have a parenthetical here that there are, you know, there are alternative theories as well, but I'm not going to get into all that detail here. But the basic idea is like something like a change, a change detector. Um, so it's elicited in the auditory cortex at around 180 milliseconds after the uh, onset of a stimulus. Um, and its elicitation requires a so-called so oddball paradigm, okay? And so here's what that looks like. So an oddball paradigm has a standard stimulus. That's a stimulus that repeats a lot. And then every once in a while you get a deviant stimulus, a rare stimulus. So here the X's are the standards and the Y's are the deviants. And the mismatch response is elicited by the deviant stimulus. So it's kind of a surprise response, like, well, that's not the thing I was thinking of, but thinking that would occur. And so here's what that looks like in MEG data. So the MMF here uh, refers to the mismatch field. 
and uh, uh, the blue line uh, shows the activity elicited by the standard stimuli in one chosen uh, sensor here, MEG sensor, and the, the red line is the response elicited by the deviant uh, stimuli, and this difference in the response is the mismatch field, okay? And you can see that there's no difference in the M100. So both types of stimuli, as we would expect, given what I just said, elicit an M100, but that response doesn't seem to care about the standard versus deviant. That difference emerges a little bit later, and the auditory mismatch field is what we uh, call that difference. Okay, so this is now interesting because it gives us a tool for investigating what actually counts as a change for our auditory cortices. So it could be the case that not all differences or changes actually drive this response. What does it take to kind of elicit that? Um, and for that reason, this, uh, the, the, the mismatch response has been used heavily uh, uh, in the study of the neural basis of categorical perception. So here's some of the early classic data, just showing very basic properties of the, of the mismatch field. So now we have a standard stimulus. So this is just pure tones. Doesn't have anything to do with uh, phonological perception. This just like lays the groundwork for how this um, effect in general behaves. So I have a standard stimulus that is, um, oh, I have this panel here. Um, it's, a, it's a kilohertz tone, so a thousand hertz uh, tone. So let's just listen to that quickly. Okay, so it's a thousand hertz. And then, so that's the standard in this setup. And we have a bunch of different deviants here. So these are now uh, different from the standard stimuli to different degrees. So first, listen, can you hear the difference between the standard, which is a thousand hertz uh, tone, and the, uh, the first deviant here, which is just a little bit different, a thousand and four hertz tone. Here's my standard. Hard to hear. Most people can't hear that very well. We're going to increase the distance. Uh, and so here the, uh, the point is that um, that um, difference is not really enough to drive the mismatch effect. So your brain does not um, uh, show much of a, a difference between the deviant and the standard. And so when we do a subtraction between those two conditions, it's pretty much a flat line. So that's how we'll be showing the size of the mismatch effect by um, doing uh, by subtracting the response to the standards from the response to the deviants. Okay, let's listen to the next pair. Here's my standard again. Now you might have heard a little bit more. It looks like there's a bit of a response that starts to emerge here, but not much yet. Uh, but then when we have a, a 16 hertz difference between the standard and, it, and the deviant, there's a clear mismatch effect. So here there's actually a pretty big difference between uh, 1008 and 1016. Okay, that's easy to observe. And then obviously the last one will be totally clear, 1032. Super cool. Okay, so here what we're learning is that, um, you know, a relatively subtle just physical distance between two stimuli can elicit this kind of mismatch effect, kind of a surprise response. And again, when I'm talking about physical distance, I just mean the actual, actual like acoustic properties of the sounds. Uh, so nothing abstract, uh, just the pure physics of, of the sound. Okay, but we wanna ask a, a kind of a more interesting question here. And that question is, is whether crossing a phoneme boundary would elicit a mismatch field, okay? So we want, we're interested in designing an experiment where the standards are on one side of a phoneme boundary and the, um, and the deviants on the other side, and we'd like to have an experiment 
where the physical distance between the standards and the deviance is not a compound in our interpretation of the results. If we manage to do that, it would be a very interesting result because it would, it would tell us that the auditory cortex at that point in time has access to phonological categories. Like at that point, so whatever, so it, it's the latency of the mismatch field, so at 180 milliseconds, the auditory cortex has like in some sense performed categorization. So it's like, oh, that's, a, that's an abstract category of T versus an abstract category of D. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've done that categorization. So we'd learn a lot about the timing of that process that it's you know, basically completed by 180 milliseconds, which is pretty specific information. But how can we make this kind of experiment? Uh, we've already learned that like even very small um, uh, difference in the physical properties of the stimuli will just drive this effect. So is this effect actually gonna be useful for uh, informing this question in a way that's not confounded by the, uh, the physical properties of the stimuli. So just a reminder, so this is like the English VOT continuum. We're going to go from da to ta. Interested in the two categories. There's the English boundary around uh, 30 milliseconds. How can we manipulate this uh, such that uh, uh, we're not just looking at the effects of changing the VOT? Okay, so here is now I've put the uh, two possible tokens of uh, from this continuum into kind of a space, into like a phonetic space of uh, T's and D's. So we could, as a first attempt, imagine an experiment where we have a T, a T token. Let's just say we picked one that has a 45 millisecond VOT and a D token that has an 18 millisecond VOT. And then we present one of them as the standard and the other one as the deviant would probably give us a mismatch effect, but we couldn't claim that that mismatch effect is reflecting phonological, you know, phon different phonological categories because we just gave the brain two different sounds. That's going to give us a mismatch feel probably anyway. So what I want to show you here is, uh, uh, is a study by Colin Phillips and colleagues, um, a classic study on this topic that used a really beautiful experimental design to tackle this challenge. And it's a little bit complicated, but it's really worthwhile thinking through it and making sure you actually understand what they did here. So I'll try to uh, walk you through this. So they did basically two things to tackle the, uh, the physical compound, okay. And the one of them was that instead of just picking one ta sound and one da sound, so they used the ta da continuum for the study, first of all. Um, and so instead of just picking one T and another D token, which is the kind of study that people have already done several times before, the, before this study. They sampled more evenly from the uh, phonetic space of each category. So instead of just using, um, instead of just using one D as the standard sound, they use lots of different Ds. And by lots of different Ds, I mean there were lots of, um, D sounds that uh, varied in BOT. So they had, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of tokens that uh, were, you know, very short v, uh, VOT and then others that were longer. Um, and then they had uh, the deviant sounds and the deviant sounds also were like more than one. So like three different types of T. So the presentation of the stimulus, like you're going to hear the way I'm showing you here is that the D would be the standard. So you're hearing that most of the time and every once in a while there's a T thrown into the mix. Okay. So now the physical compound is basically blurred. Okay. So this becomes a little bit more blurry. So it'd be kind of like somewhat surprising if your brain could pick up on just the physical difference between kind of like the 
slightly higher cloud of BOTs and then the lower cloud of BOTs. That's like a really subtle difference to, um, to, for your brain to notice. So maybe that alone wouldn't drive the mismatch field. Um, what's not a subtle difference for your brain is the presence of a T category and a D category. So if we think about this categorically, it's very clear that there's a bunch of Ds and a bunch of Ts because as we learned uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the video before this one, your brain, you know, your perceptual system is very uh, bad at discriminating within category. So in fact, as an English speaker, you don't really hear the differences between all these Ds. They all sound like these and similarly for the teeth. So when we present the uh, stimulus space um, as a phonological space, there's actually very clearly two different categories. It's just that when we show the physical variant, physical variance uh, among the stimuli just looks like there's just a, you know, a bunch of different stimuli and the contrast is not so obvious. Okay. So in this experimental setup, if the auditory cortex is sensitive to phonological categories at the time of the mismatch response, then the deviant T's should elicit this mismatch effect because at that point, your brain would be noticing that like, oh, there's a T sound every once in a while, whereas I'm most of, most of the time I'm hearing a D. And it wouldn't really care about the details. Uh, within category. Okay, but that's still, if that finding is obtained, it still doesn't rule out an explanation purely in terms of the physical distance between the stimuli. Because it could still be the case that, well, maybe, even though I said this is unlikely that your brain could just notice this relatively subtle um, difference between this higher cloud of uh, sounds and the lower cloud of sounds, maybe it does, maybe we just didn't know that already. So we need to still do something else to try to rule out that purely physical um, or acoustic um, explanation of, the, of a possible um, mismatch effect in this setup. And uh, these authors did that really cleverly and the way they did it was basically just lifting the entire stimulus set up by 20 milliseconds in BOT. So you, you keep the physical arrangement of the stimuli exactly the same. So if the mismatch response is able to uh, pick up on the physical difference, then nothing should have changed. But by doing that lift, they deconfounded the phonological and the physical manipulation. So in this original setup, yes, the deviants were, uh, you know, kind of acoustically, they, they were the longer VOTs, and they were also on the other side of the phonological boundary, the perceptual boundary. So that's the two things are confounded, a little bit longer, other side of the perceptual boundary. But if we perform this lift, then the, the, the two um, explanations, so the acoustic one and the phonological one, are no longer confounded. So now in this setup, the standards are going to come from both sides of the perceptual boundary. So some of the standards are going to be heard as T's and others are going to be heard as D's and the deviants are still going to come from this higher cloud. So now, between the deviants and the standards, there's not a phonemic boundary, no perceptual boundary here, that's down here. And so now, if these guys manage to elicit the mismatch effect, then it, that has to be acoustically driven. So in some sense, this control version of the experiment will answer the question of whether uh, a mismatch effect can be elicited um, sheerly off of the physical properties of this stimulus arrangement, which seems unlikely, but that's why the, um, the control experiment is needed. Okay, so here the deviant should not elicit uh, a phonemically driven mismatch field. 
because they're just not perceived really as different from a, at least a whole bunch of the standards. The standards cross the, the phonological boundary. Okay, so just to recap. So in the first experiment, the standards fall on one side of the perceptual boundary and the deviants on the other. So the standards and deviants differ both in physical distance and in phonemic category. So this is the confounded experiment. But then we have the control experiment that addresses the compound. So in the second experiment, the physical distance between standards and deviants is just exactly like in the first experiment. But now the standards and deviants are no longer differentiated by the phonological boundary. So the standards and deviants differ only in the physical distance. Now we want to know, well, is you know, first of all, do we get a mismatch effect in the first case, and then for the first experiment, and then whether it survives the removal of the phonological difference between the standards and the okay. So now I know this is complicated, but I'm walking you through this so that you see how hard it is to get at this kind of question and address the physical compound. And it's not done very often, and, and I think it's done very nicely in this study. Okay, so a mismatch field experiment is elicited in the first experiment. Is if a mismatch field that is elicited in the first experiment is actually driven by the category difference between standards and deviants and not just the physical difference, then we should expect it to disappear in the second experiment. So is that what happens? Yes, it is. That's exactly what happens. So here uh, I'm showing you the difference waves same kind of different difference waves that we uh, looked at when we were just uh, looking at the mismatch effects elicited by the pure tones uh, between the deviants and the standards in the first experiment, which I'm calling the phonological experiments, and the second experiment, the acoustic experiment. And there's a big difference. <laughs> so in the phonological experiment, we get a big difference, a beautiful mismatch effect. Uh, whereas in the acoustic experiment, it disappears. So it really does seem to be the case that this uh, effect of the first experiment is driven by the phonological difference between the categories and not by the acoustic difference because the acoustic difference by itself just isn't enough to drive the mismatch effect. Okay. Summarize, so by 180 milliseconds, our auditory cortices seem to have extracted from the input the relevant features that we need in order to categorize sounds into phonemes. Um, but now the mismatch effect is a surprise response. And what that means is that really the categorization Itself kind of has to happen before we get to be surprised by the categorization. So really the computations that drive this response should be happening earlier. Um, although there's a lot of research on that earlier peak, the M100, it really has not shed light on this question in a sort of satisfying way. But now we have some newer data that is really interesting. So that's the ECOG um, intracranial IEG, IEG data uh, that is beginning to speak to this question, I think, in, in an interesting way. So we're going to uh, finish by taking a, a, a peek at that. So here's uh, data from Nima Mezgarani's group up at Columbia uh, from uh, a, a published a few years ago. And so here, we have uh, exactly that patient situation that I mentioned earlier. So this is patient data from individuals who are being prepared for surgery. And as part of that preparation, they have a, an EEG electrode grid uh, on the surface of their cortex. And in these patients, that grid is uh, on, the, on the lateral surface of the of the left temporal lobe. Okay, so it's in superior temporal cortex or close to the auditory areas. Uh, not actually in the sylvian fissure, but on the lateral surface. And uh, these um, 
these participants are listening to just naturalistic language, so they, they're listening to 500 sentences, okay? So not like a controlled experiments, or almost like the opposite approach from what I was just telling you about, just 500 sentences, they're listening to them. And so here you have, so and what eyes they were, you get the sound wave, and then um, that's the spectrogram, you segment the whole stimulus into phonemes. So here you have the, the phoneme segmentation, that same uh, expression. And then what you're looking at is the sensitivity of each of these electrodes to the speech sounds. So they developed an index of this phonological sensitivity, which they call PSI, uh, phoneme sensitivity index and um here for example we're plotting like so the red here shows that that uh, uh, electrode is very sensitive to this particular uh, type of sound um so you're plotting across time and then here on the y-axis we have all the electrodes plot um okay so now let's zoom into the individual electrodes so what we're seeing here, and, and I'm not going to into the details of the study, but what the important conclusion is that we have these kind of clouds of sensitivity uh, when we're looking at the sensitivity of each electrode across time um, and uh, examining it for each particular sound group. So the sounds are sort of organized here in a meaningful way. So for example, here in electrode one, this electrode is very sensitive to all of these sounds. And now if you kind of look at them and uh, examine what we've already learned, you'll notice that, oh, those are actually the stop consonants of English. Okay, so these uh, form kind of like a grouping of sounds and there's a particular feature that unifies them there, the stop consonants. And similarly for the other clouds, there's a, a sort of a generalization about um, those sounds. So here, for example, we have uh, vowels that are all uh, articulated kind of to, towards the front of the mouth. So what we learned from these newer data is that most of these um, superior temporal gyrus electrodes were sensitive not just to individual phonemes, so you don't get like, oh, I like these, but rather to groups of phonemes that share some feature or features. So we've talked about distinctive features. Um, and so these are uh, data that suggest that the feature space that is relevant for phonological categorization is represented uh, in superior temporal cortex. And crucially, uh, the timing of the sensitivity uh, precedes the mismatch effect. So this shows us that, in fact, the information is, in some sense, uh, present uh, before we get these mismatch effects. Um, and that's kind of what needs to be the case. Otherwise, the mismatch effect would be very mysterious. Oops, let's summarize. So, um, so when the spatial distribution of responses to phonemes uh, is studied in superior temporal cortex, we find evidence that most likely the entire feature space of speech sounds is represented in uh, auditory areas, you know, 100 to 200 milliseconds after the onset of the sound and probably even earlier, although um, I didn't show you um, evidence for that here. And given the mismatch literature, something like that had to be the case. Um, um, and now we kind of have uh, relevant evidence. And so today, um, although we still don't know how our brains perform phonological categorization, we have, we know very little about the how questions of the brain uh, in general. We do know that the relevant information is represented in superior temporal cortex starting around at least around 100 milliseconds, and that by 180 milliseconds, categorization seems to have 